It's wild, it's wonderful, it's home. From the peaceful sites to the adventurous rivers, we want to protect our great state. But most importantly, we want to protect our people. When someone from our community gets injured in an accident, big insurance companies out of state look at you as a number. At Cranston and Edwards, we fight for you, getting you the settlement you deserve. Cranston and Edwards, we protect you. When your ride needs a winter wardrobe, head over to the Tire Lady at Rainbow Tire. Get outfitted with studded tires by the brands you trust. We also specialize in computerized alignment, engine analysis, oil changes, brake jobs, shocks, and more. It's round tires and square deals at Rainbow Tire. Whether you're mud bogging, work in the fields, or just cruising, the Tire Lady has just the right tire for you. And if you want your ride to really stand out, ask about tire and wheel combinations. Get the most out of your vehicle with the perfect set of shoes from the Tire Lady at Rainbow Tire. We have a very exciting program today featuring a history alive performer, Eileen Evans, portraying Harriet Tubman, Al Anderson and friends singing gospel songs, Jeremy Thomas reading a book about Frederick Douglass, the NAACP, NAACP Essay Contest winners reading their essays on what's different today, civil rights before and after Martin Luther King Jr., the Cheat Lake Elementary School Choir, and an opportunity for you to raise your voice in song, which I hope you'll all do. We are, have, we are pleased to have Mayor Bill Kowecki provide a welcome for our 14th annual Martin Luther King Jr. Day celebration. Thank you very much. It's great to see such a turnout for this day. On behalf of the city of Morgantown, I would like to welcome you to this beautiful, beautiful theater, the Metropolitan Theater, for our community celebration of Martin Luther King Day. Thank you for the Community Coalition on Social Justice and to Main Street Morgantown for being co-sponsors of this event. The city of Morgantown is pleased to support this activity. You can see on your program, the theme for today is courage to be free. What does that mean? Courage is defined as the ability to do something that frightens one. Did Dr. King or Harriet Tubman have courage? We can see by their actions that they did. They stood up against injustice, and by doing so, they made a difference. That's why we honor them today. I take inspiration in the fact that one person's life, as demonstrated by the people that we honor today, can and does affect positive change. I sincerely hope that we will take these lessons forward and fulfill these dreams. Thank you so much for coming. Enjoy the day. Thank you, Mayor Bill. In addition to our celebration of Martin Luther King Jr. Day today, it is my pleasure to be a part of the 20th anniversary celebration of the Community Coalition for Social Justice, CCSJ. I will share a few highlights about the history of CCSJ and hope you'll sign up in the lobby to receive our newsletter and become active in social justice events throughout our community. The Community Coalition for Social Justice was organized in December of 1999 after a call from Emily Spieler, a former law professor at WVU, to respond proactively to threats to our community, specifically in reaction to Ku Klux Klan activity in nearby cities. Emily regrets not being able to be here today to share this history with you. CCSJ's mission is to bring together people from throughout the Morgantown and nearby areas, religious organizations, faculty and staff of area schools and the university, labor unions, community advocacy organizations, and individuals dedicated to promoting the principles of social, environmental, and economic justice and respect for all persons. We oppose discrimination and hate motivated violence in Morgantown and surrounding communities. When CCSJ first started,
we lobbied on behalf of the Civil Rights Team Project, a program of the Civil Rights Division of the West Virginia Attorney General's Office to address bullying and discrimination in schools. The program was active in Morgantown High, South Junior High, and St. Francis schools. CCSJ members wrote the City of Morgantown's first ordinance to establish a Human Rights Commission in 2001. And in 2012, we worked to revitalize that commission by soliciting support from many neighborhood associations. Since then, we have supported the commission's work to make Morgantown a more inclusive city by endorsing their resolutions on marriage equality, the rights of immigrants, refugees, and asylees, and the importance of welcoming everyone to Morgantown. Please visit the Human Rights Commission table in the lobby to learn more about their work. We have also spoken to the Morgantown City Council to endorse efforts such as the Morgantown Green Team's request that the City Council support the goals of the Paris Climate Change Agreement. Since 2006, we have staged a Martin Luther King Junior Day celebration in downtown Morgantown. In 2011, we first co-sponsored the event with Main Street Morgantown, which really increased our publicity. We have organized the acquisition of collections of books with funds from the Morgantown City Council for the public library, focusing on disabilities, economic justice, the environment, women's studies, African American studies, <coughs> diversity, tolerance, and justice. We procured a grant from the Appalachian Community Fund to purchase some of these books for the Clay Patel and Clinton District Libraries. In 2009, we organized a forum on the regional jail, which was well attended. CCSJ has sponsored social justice fairs, discussion sessions, and diversity picnics to get groups together to talk about their concerns and priorities. As a result of these discussions, in 2010, we helped sponsor a fair housing program specifically related to the lack of accessible housing in this area for people with disabilities. We held a program in 2011 at Greater St. Paul African Methodist Episcopal Church featuring two outstanding women who relayed their experiences during the Civil Rights Movement. Charlene Marshall, the first African American woman mayor in West Virginia, and Faith Holsart, an activist in Albany, Georgia. We conducted a religious diversity forum at St. Paul's in 2014 with speakers from the African Methodist Episcopal, Hindu, Buddhist, Baha'i, Jewish, and Muslim communities. In 2013 and 2014, we had an art exhibits at Arts Mod in conjunction with our Martin Luther King Jr. Day celebration. This event was with local artists and students. Our 2014 theme was Every Good Thing Begins with a Dream. Our ninth Martin Luther King Jr. Day events theme was 2015, in 2015 was The Road to the Vote. To honor the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and led to good contacts with the League of Women Voters who became an organizational member of CCSJ, please visit their table in the lobby also. At our 2015 picnic, we got updates on various groups working on social justice and made a good, good contact with the Morgantown Police Department as it works to do more outreach in our community. And the Morgantown Police Department became an organizational member. We have written letters of support and published a series of articles in the Dominion Post related to social justice issues. Some of our most recent endeavors include support for the Designing Across Divides Conference last March, participation in the first Morgantown Pride block party in Greenmont in April, and participation in the Still They Resisted program in September that focused on exploring the lesser known heroes of the LGBTQ rights movement of the last 50 years. We distribute a monthly e-newsletter, e have a website at ccsjwv.org and a Facebook page. We were honored to receive one of Morgantown Monongalia County League of Women Voters first social justice awards in 2015 and recognition from the Human Rights Commission in 2017. 
we hope through our actions and the support of so many people in the community, we will continue to address issues of social justice to keep Morgantown a welcoming, open, inclusive community dedicated to treating one another with civility and respect. Thank you. Our next performers are no strangers to this celebration, and many of you will know the words to the songs they sing. Please welcome Al Anderson and friends and sing along. Well, thank you all so much for being here, and uh, we are the Alan Anderson and Friends, and uh, used to be the Flying Colors for about 10 or 12 years. Uh, we formed the, uh, 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 our new group about a year ago, and we came together to raise money for the kids in Uganda. And uh, that's how we got all the friends up here, you know, for, uh, for this, uh, for our sing. So we hope you enjoy our show, and uh, we thank you all for coming.
in here. So everybody stood away from me because they said, oh, that's not going to happen. But here we are about 14 years later. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. projected on the screen.
<laughs> How y'all doing today? This book is entitled, Words Set Me Free. Now, I was trying to do a little research about um, the, how, how Frederick Douglass and Dr. King kind of tied together. And so in, in, in the little bit of research that I did last night, I, uh, I discovered that when Martin Luther King Jr. was young, his father gave him, uh, I believe it was an autobiography of Frederick Douglass. And so what I, I believe that that helped uh, set his trajectory for how he developed his speeches and the many words and the many speeches that he gave. And he was, of course, a, a minister. And so the many sermons that he gave, a lot of those words helped set the course for us today and how it guided the path through the civil rights movement. All right, so words set me free. It's the story of Frederick Douglass. Lisa Klein Ransom with the illustration by James E. Ransom. So we've been singing a lot about Jesus. So y'all y'all pray for me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> My mama was named Harriet Bailey. They say my master, Captain Aaron Anthony, was my daddy. After I was born, they sent me to my grandmama and my mama to another plantation. But when she could, she'd walk the 12 miles in the middle of the night to come and see me. Must have been a long walk, because by the time she got there, she was too tired to talk. I remember she would just sit on the dirt floor near my pallet watching me. I never saw her face in the light of day. In the morning, she'd be gone. Sometimes I wondered if I had only dreamed she had been by my side, her rough hands gently stroking my face. When I was still young, Cook told me my mama took sick. I never saw her again. I lived with my grandmama, Betsy, in her cabin until our master told her to bring me up to the big house on what we called Great House Farm. Grandmama went back to her cabin, but I stayed behind with the other slave children. I was just six years old. Much of my time was my own as I was not yet old enough to work the fields. We ate our two meals a day out of a trough just like the animals in the barn. We were always hungry, so we shoved down our meals of cornmeal mush with shells and dirty hands. But even the animals were rested in the heat of the afternoon sun, and they were never whipped, for, uh, whipped bloody for being too tired, too sick, or too slow. At eight years old, my mistress told me I was leaving the plantation to go to another master, her brother-in-law in Baltimore. Master rented me out to make extra money. I could not imagine a life beyond the plantation. From Cousin Tom, an older slave on the plantation, who had once been to Baltimore, he told me of a city so big and pretty, it seemed like a thousand great farms. On Saturday, when we sailed down the Miles River with all our own in the world, my first pair of scratchy britches and a shift, I did not cry. I was ready to leave Talbot County, Maryland behind. We arrived at Smith's Wharf on Sunday morning. Old Tom never told me that Baltimore looked as if it floated on a sea of waves. At the Aliciana Street House of my new master, Hugh All, his wife Sophia opened the door and greeted me. Mrs. was small, not much bigger than me. And she had the first friendly white face I ever did see. It took us a while to get used to each other. She, she had never owned slaves, and I had never been treated like a paid servant. I was glad no one ever told her that there's a big difference between a servant you pay and a slave you own. During the day, I ran errands for my master. In the evening, Mrs. sat by the fire and read her Bible aloud. Her kindly smile and voice warmed me as I entered the room. I do not know why, but I asked her to teach me to read. On that night, she, she took me directly into her library, 
pulled out the first book she saw and sat me down next to her. We started with the letter A and then continued from there. The letters felt strange on my lips. As I read, I remembered hearing of a boy back at the plantation who, who he had his thumb chopped off when he was caught reading. And the letters I was reciting, well, well they got caught in my throat. <clears throat> I remembered my old master's words when he gathered all us slaves together to announce anyone caught trying to read would be whipped. And my mouth was so very dry. Every day she gave me more letters to learn until I knew I had the whole alphabet and a few words memorized. She promised me that I would be able to read the Bible on my own. Now I wanted to read for myself where in the Bible it said one man should own another. But before that could happen, he found out. Now I couldn't blame her. Mrs. Woso Brown, she had taught me all of my letters and such a short time that she told her husband so. I thought he was going to whip me right there, but his words hurt worse than any lashing. He should know nothing but to obey his master, to do as he is told to do, he shouted. And my mistress looked away ashamed. If you teach him how to read, there would be no keeping him. He would no more be fit to be a slave. I may not have known how to read, but I knew that if learning made me no longer fit to be a slave, then I would secure my freedom one letter at a time. She locked the door to the library and hid away the newspapers. She watched me all the time to make sure I was not putting together any more of those letters she had taught me. I knew she wished she could take it all back, but it was too late. With a brick, a lump of chalk, was first how I practiced my letters. Scratched them all along the brick streets and wooden fences of Baltimore. Now, now P, P looked like a sail on one of those ships. L, it, it was a leg with a big foot. Two sticks crossed in the middle. Now, now that was an X. There was plenty of food in Master All's house. Food enough to share. I started bringing along some bread in case some of the white children from the neighborhood needed convincing. They did not have much, so for, for just a piece of bread, I dared them to, to write letters better than me. What they wrote, I copied. Told them my name, now, now let me see you try it, I said. Fast as I could, I ran to complete all my errands for my missus. Then me and my friends would go to work on writing. Rolled in the seat of my britches was where I kept my copy book. Mine now that I took it from Master's son, Thomas. Even though he was only six, Mrs. said he learned his letters a year ago. He was reading now. While I ran through the wharves and narrow streets of Baltimore, I was reading. The words the ship carpenter scribbled on timbers and masts. The name of ships and streets, headlines from the newspaper held in a newsboy's hand. I kept all those words in my head and copied them into my book when I got a chance. As I ran, I could almost feel myself free, run into a home where no man called himself a master of another. Sometimes before I returned, I stood on the docks, watching the ships free to go as they very well pleased. At 12 years old, with tips I saved from errands, I bought my first newspaper and learned new words, liberty, justice, and freedom. Abolition was the word the newspaper used when they called for ending slavery. These were the words my master would never want me to learn. Now that I was reading about Negroes in the North, free from burden of slavery, it was as if someone had lit a candle to my world. I saw freedom everywhere I looked, and the hope of it was what kept me alive. For seven years, I worked for my master and his missus down at the shipyard, lifting and laboring, and back at their house, toting and hauling, always pretending to be something I was not, content to be a slave. When my old master, Captain Anthony, died, I, I, I had to return to Great House Farm to be divided up with the rest of his property, along with the sheep, the horses, and the swine. 
great house farm remained the same. Hunger, weariness, sadness seeped into the souls of every slave. The boy who returned to his birthplace was not the same one who had left years earlier. That young boy was replaced with a 15-year-old who was free on the inside, but not yet free on the outside. Though my copybooks and newspapers were long gone, words comforted me in the fields as I chopped cotton from sunup to sundown, and words laid down with me at night when my body ached with pain and hunger. I knew that the words would put an end to my suffering, I just wasn't sure, sure when and, and how. I was hired out to work for Mr. William Freeland. And while he was kinder than most, he was still a man who believed it was his divine right to own another human being. Since my return to Talbot County, I became friends with Henry, John, and Handy. And I often spoke of my years in Baltimore. When I, first, when I was first told, when I first told them, I learned to read, they stopped short and looked around to see if anyone was, was, was nearby. They asked me to teach them, and of course I did. That's how I knew I could trust them. From then on, I thought I would devote my Sundays to teaching these my loved fellow slaves how to read. At first, we had school among the trees, me scratching out letters and words in the dirt with a stick. John caught on, now he caught on fast, and he helped teach others. They never miss a Sunday. Sometimes they brought others who would then bring us. We had a school before long, but as far as the master knew, we were having church. Sitting on rocks and stumps and tied from the week's work, we sang out the alphabet like we sang out spirituals. Now, those of us who could read from the Bible, we were all doing God's work. During one of our services, I got the idea for how I could run. Someone mentioned they knew where Massa kept his paper and quills, and did I think we could use them? At first, I said no. We needed nothing from Massa, but, but then I started to think. First, I approached John, and then three others decided to join us in our escape. We would steal a boat from the neighboring Hamilton farm and make our way into the night on Chesapeake Bay. From there, we would follow the North Star. Eight years had passed since I sat in the library of Mrs. Auld learning my letters. And eight years still since Miss Massa Auld had issued the warning to his wife, it was the only time in my life when I agreed with my master, I was unfit to be a slave. Just before Easter, with the fine quill and paper secured by one of the house slaves, I wrote in a firm and steady hand, this is to certify that I, the undersigned, to have given the bearer, my servant Frederick Bailey, full liberty to go to Baltimore to spend the Easter holidays, written with my own hand, B.C. 1835, William Hamilton, near St. Michael's in Talbot County, Maryland. I always knew that somehow words would set me free, but words on paper were now going to let me walk right out of Talbot County and into the freedom of knowing. Words set me free. The story of young Frederick Douglass. Now, now, at the end of the book, there's an author's note, and it's, I need to read that part of it. Uh, it says, Frederick Bailey did not escape that evening. An informant revealed their plot to the master, and all members in the party were jailed. Before he was taken away, Frederick managed to throw away his paper, his, his pass, and instructed his friends to swallow the passes he had written for them. Uh, whispering, own oh, nothing. After a week in prison and fearing he'd be killed if he stayed in the area, he was freed by his master and returned to Hugh Auld in Baltimore. Three years later, on September 3rd, 1838, Frederick, with the help of conductors on the Underground Railroad, successfully escaped to New York. Has anybody seen the movie, uh, Harriet? It's a great movie. You need to see it if you haven't. It's about the Underground Railroad. 
they successfully escaped to New York where he changed his name to Frederick Douglass. He eventually moved to New Bedford, Massachusetts with his wife, Ann Murray. Like most slaves, Frederick never knew his actual birthday, but when he was 17 years old, his master estimated it be around February 1818. In 1841, he was invited to speak at an anti-slavery society meeting and he became a lecturer on the abolition of slavery. In 1845, he wrote and published his book, his first book, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, which described the evils of slavery and, it's immediately, and it immediately became a bestseller. Two years later, he began an abolitionist newspaper entitled The North Star. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to introduce Dottie Wilson, who will introduce our NAACP essay contest winners and tell you a little bit about the history of the essays. Good evening. I'm Dottie Wilson of NAACP. The, N the NAACP essay contest is sponsored by the Morgantown Kingwood chapter of the NAACP and the Greater St. Paul AME Church. The guidelines are to select the civil rights category, learn about your chosen civil rights category by interviewing one or more person who are experienced or witnessed activities that occurred within your civil rights category, or by interviewing a descendant of the person, or by reading about your chosen category. The essay must provide details of the civil rights category, provide documentation of all sources used, and a minimum of 300 words. The winners of the first place category in either elementary, middle, or high school receive $100. Today we have two essay winners, Demarcus Brandy from Mountaineer Middle School, who is also a former first place winner, and Olivia Toole from Suncrest Elementary School. Olivia will read her essay first. Good afternoon. My name is Olivia Toole, and I will be reading my NAACP essay about civil rights before and after Martin Luther King Jr. Have you ever worried about being made fun of because of the way you look? Worse, could you imagine being kicked out of school because of your race? Well, Ruby Bridges could. She anxiously walked to school accompanied by U.S. Marshals. Though she met protesters who had hateful words at her, she persisted. Martin Luther King Jr. inspired people and children like Ruby Bridges, all because he had a dream and a plan to end racial, racial seg segregation, have peaceful protests, and to change the laws. He, Ruby Bridges, her mother, and all of the other people who took action knew that segregated schools faced many issues, including building quality, little or age supplies, and poor location. Segregated schools were a big problem for African American children. At first, many of the white people were upset because African American children were attending white schools. Marshall had, Marshalls had to walk some kids in because the white people were threatening to hurt the children who were walking into the white school. Ruby Bridges and her mother were accompanied by U.S. Marshals every single day when they went to school. Many African American parents were scared for their kids. Martin Luther King Jr. inspired people all over the country to persist. At first, African American schools had horrible building quality. All the schools were low quality. They, all had very, they were all very old and they hadn't been kept well. They had terrible conditions such as broken chairs, no water fountains, toilets that didn't work, and no air conditioning. Martin Luther King Jr. inspired people to stand up for the right to go to better schools. Now African Americans can go to great schools. The schools that they go to are kept in great quality. At first, the location was terrible. Some schools were extremely far away. Kids had to walk forever. Like Ruby Bridges, her segregated school took forever to walk to, but the white school that she went to was only five blocks away. Now the location is great because Martin Luther King Jr. inspired people in the country to change segregation. Some schools are right by kids' houses since African American children could go to white schools. A lot of the African American schools had no materials before Martin Luther King Jr. None of the parents had enough money to buy materials. They had no textbooks or workbooks. Now all the children can get textbooks and workbooks. Their schools have lots of materials, all because Martin Luther King Jr. inspiring people to do these things because he had a dream to change the laws, end racial segregation, and have peaceful protests. 
Martin Luther King Jr. changed a lot for African Americans, but we still have lots of things to work on. A lot of people still aren't being treated fairly because of their color. Many students still worry about their safety. Kids all across the world are calling for a change. We still have a lot to work on because there are still some schools that have poor location, poor building quality, less materials than some schools, and still some poor location. But all of this matters so kids can have a better life and education. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. And now, Demarcus will read his essay. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Demarcus, and I'd like to read you my essay entitled Civil Rights Before and After Dr. Martin Luther King. The Civil Rights Movement was an empowering yet dangerous time for blacks in America. Before the Civil Rights Movement, public accommodations were unfair and difficult for minority groups because everyone, every public place was segregated. All places were segregated because of the Plessy versus Ferguson 1896. In this case, the United States Supreme Court declared the facilities for blacks and whites could be separate but equal. Minorities had to do things differently than whites. For example, they had to use a different entrance in rest restaurants and hospitals, had to sit, of, sit in the back of a bus. Russell Parks went to jail for refusing to sit in the back of a bus. Because of that, black people protested to improve public accommodations and to make things equal. Some of the protests included Freedom Rise and sit-ins. Freedom Rise were a series of political protests against segregation by whites and who, by, by blacks and whites, who rode buses together through the American Southern States in 1961. During these rides, violent resistance was encountered from South Carolina to Alabama, where buses were set on fire and African Americans were beaten by white people. This happened because white people were angry and hated these protests. Sit-ins were a form of nonviolent protest in which black people would occupy a white-only place and refuse to leave until soon. Sit-ins started with four African-American college students in Greensboro, North Carolina. The students asked for coffee, but the servers refused to give it to them. Today, public accommodation is inclusive of all races. The United States has anti-discrimination laws to help ensure all people have the same opportunity. It also makes our country stronger by respecting everyone's differences. One of the laws that is in place to prevent discrimination is the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The law was passed by President Lyndon B. Johnson on July 2, 1964. It guaranteed equal employment for all and ensured public facilities were integrated. Today, black people can go to the same places and receive the same benefits as white people. Currently, 13% of the United States population is African-American. Before the Civil Rights Movement and today are very different in many ways. The efforts of Dr. Martin Luther King, other activists, and protesters of all races brought about legislation to end segregation, black voter suppression, and discriminatory employment and housing practices. With the limited number of African-Americans in the United States, minorities still face some challenges. Today, black Americans continue to be labeled, harassed, and victimized in American society. Even though African Americans face challenges, great progress is still being made. We must continue to treat people fairly and find healthy ways to confront and prevent discrimination. Thank you. On yesterday, the Marks and Olivia received their check for $100 and a gift certificate, and a certificate, and they will uh, have a pizza party for their classroom. I encourage all students to participate in this essay contest. Look forward to your school in September. The essays will be out in, in September. Thank you. Our theme for the 14th annual Martin Luther King Jr. Day is Courage to be Free. Who better epitomizes this kind of courage than Harriet Tubman? Harriet Tubman was born into slavery and held captive, but she dreamed of freedom. Through hard work and her willingness to risk everything, including her life, she was able to make that dream come through. Once she gained her own freedom, that was not enough for her, and she became a conductor, an engineer on the Underground Railroad. She risked her own life many times to lead others secretly and safely to a part of the country where they could live in freedom. 
Harriet stood against the laws that would return slaves to their masters as common property. Harriet was supported by those who practiced a belief that no one had the right to own another. She was never caught or captured. She never lost anyone along the route to freedom. In her work on the Underground Railroad, she could truly say, I never run my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. Let us welcome Miss Harriet Tubman to tell us how she got started on the road to freedom. Their groans and cries, I have seen their tears, and I would give every drop of blood in my veins to set them free. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt land. Tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Come on, children, we'll rest here for a little while. Oh, sweet child. It take courage to be free. Now, I never run my train off the track, and I never lost a passage. Besides, ain't no going back. Because what if you're caught, or beaten, or maybe you tell on us? You know, we going all the way. Broken, bloody, or bruised, we going all the way if I have to carry you all the way. What's on the road? Where's your mama? There's your daddy. You see, who God give us is each other. And courage come from keeping the people that love you here in your heart. You keep that light shining bright. And can't nobody make you afraid. Can't nobody make you do wrong. Never mind when them clouds be covering up. <laughs> The stars still shine. Stars shine behind them clouds. Stars shine behind them clouds. Close your eyes and see them shine. Close your eyes and see them shine. <laughs> you got a right to be free. You got a right to the tree of life. When I was a little girl, I come up to my daddy and I say, Daddy, did God make us slaves? Mm. Who told you that? Look, see, daddy gets snappy when he get angry. And I say, well, Miss Self at the big house, she said that, that God made black people slaves and I must obey her if I want to go to heaven. Daddy say, mm, 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 sure. Only a man can make another man a slave. God got nothing to do with that. What your heart say God be like? You listen to your heart. Can't nobody tell you nothing better than that. You got a right, and I got a right. We all got a right to the tree of life. You got a right, I got a right. We all got a right to the tree of life. The very time I thought I was lost, the dungeon shook and the chains fell off. You may hinder me here, but you cannot dare. God in the heaven gonna answer a prayer. You got a right, I got a right. We all got a right to the tree of life. See, I keep my daddy here in my heart like a light shining bright. You know, can't nobody make me afraid. When I'm doing what I believe God want me to do, ain't no place for fear. See, I remember where we come from. And I remember what brings to this day. Plantation wake every day to the same sound. And out to the fields we go. 
Ain't no rain to wet you. Yes, I wanna go home. Ain't no sun to burn you. Yes, I wanna go home. I believe there ain't no stormy weather. Yes, I wanna go home. Ain't no ribs a cracking. Yes, I wanna go home. Hey, me calling. Ain't no tribulation. Yes, I wanna go home. Push along, believer. Yes, I wanna go home. I wanna go home. It was late in the fall, and we was all in the barn, shucking corn, racing to see who could shuck the most, the fastest. And one man stands silent, not joining in the singing. The corn fall from his hand. He say he needs some tobacco from the stove. Next thing, he was gone. Oh, I hope you made it this time. You see, Jim was a big man, valuable. He'd run away twice before. Last time he made it all the way to Baltimore. Well, we'd work together in the fields that summer. And he don't want to tell me how you travel on an underground railroad. <laughs> Conductors and all. Well, by the time overseer noticed that Jim was missing, that bound to be free man had made it cross the field. Oh, ride on, ride on, ride on, Moses, ride on, King Emmanuel, I want to go home in the morning. <laughs> Overseer wasn't expecting no outbreak. He didn't have no horse, he didn't have no gun. He had to take off on foot. And I took off right out behind him. See, I knew where Jim was going, and I knew the shortcut. And as I was coming up into the store, trying to warn Jim of the danger, before I could tell him anything, the door slammed him. And in stomped the overseer. He take that black snake off his shoulder, say, I whip you good for running away from your work. And he ordered me to help tie Jim up. But I just stood there on the door. With my arms stretched out, I couldn't move. And Jim, he slipped out the door beside me. Well, seeing that, overseer reached over on the counter to pick up a two-pound lead weight, and he threw it at Jim. It missed Jim. But it hit me right in the middle of the head. And the world went black. Mm -hmm. Oh Lord, you done took away two of my babies. Please don't take this one too. See, I woke up to the sound of my mama singing and praying and rocking me there in her arms. See, when they brought my little crumpled heap of bones in there to mama, there was so much blood everywhere, they were sure I was going to die. But Mama never lost hope. She just kept praying, tending me when she could, coming in from the fields. She even made Daddy risk cutting on Master's land so she could feed me some proper nourishing food. Little by little, I healed up. But I was never the same after that. See, I have uh, sleeping spells. And I fall to sleep right in the middle of anything and without any warning. And can't nobody wake me up till I wake up by myself. Not even the lash having a fit. But if you call my name softly, I might be stirred. First time it happened, Mama liked to die of fright. She might be standing up in the yard, bucket in hand, on the way to this morning. Take off the See, Master had no use for me now. He didn't want no troublemaker. He started bringing buyers around to the quarters trying to sell me. 
so he could make some profit off of it. He bring them bars around, and they inspect you the way they inspect a horse, a cow, a pig, and such. Run your hands up your legs and all in your mouth. He bring them eyes around. And I just that kind of silly kind of woozy. Well, I figured that was the only way to keep from being sold. Take it away from my family. One man say, she ain't even worth a sixpence. I wonder what he think I was worth now. And then I start praying for a mass. And I say, Lord, change his heart. Make him a good man. But he kept bringing them bars around. And bring him around. And bring him around. And I changed my prayers. I say, Lord, if you can't change his heart, if you can't make him a good man, then put him out the way. And it was soon after that master died. See, prayer powerful thing. And I know it was my prayers would put him down. And then I prayed like I'd never prayed before for the good Lord to, to, to sweep, to sweep. I'd go to the troughs to try to wash and wash my heart till it was pure and clean. Because can't nobody free your heart for God, sweet child. Nobody. If there's anybody here like weeping Mary, call upon your Jesus and he'll draw nigh. If there's anybody here like weeping Mary, call And he'll draw nigh. Oh, glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory be to God who lives on high. <sighs> Since uh, Master couldn't sell me, he got me hired by the man that my daddy worked for. My daddy Ben worked for Jim Stewart over on the Stewart plantation. See, my daddy cut timber. He was foreman over the other men running them logs on on down the Chesapeake. And Mr. Stewart, he wanted to start me out in the big house. But I hated that inside work. And I asked him if I could work outside, out with the men in the forest and the fields with my daddy. And he let me try. I proved to be more work than many of them men. But I had to set aside my hoping for escape. You see, I was afraid I might have one of my sleeping spells out on the road somewhere and not wake up in time to save myself. But I couldn't, I couldn't stop thinking and dreaming. And the same dream come to me night after night. See, I'd be flying, floating up over the river and on and on, just like a bird. And then I'd come to a river or a fence and I'd start sinking down, down, losing. I just couldn't make it. And then ladies dressed in white would appear with outstretched arms. They reached out, grabbed a hold, and pulled me across. I held on to them dreams. There's the only part of me that was really mine. Slave master can take your body, but he can't have your heart, your soul, your mind, lest you give it up. You belong to nobody but you. Got to have your own mind. See our people in the sky take a handful. New the morning of the dawn. New the morning of the dawn. 
angels. I passed a Quaker woman on the road one day. She asked me about that scar on my forehead, and I told her the story. She said, if I ever need help, I should come to her. And I knew what she meant when she glanced up at the overseer. She would help me escape. Well, excited, I come home. And I tell my husband, John, that we could both go north to freedom now, have a real life, that I knew a woman who would help us. But John just turned cold on me. He said, I'll be first to tell your master if you do. I couldn't believe what I heard. But the look in his eyes told it all. He truly would. Now you see, John Tubman was a free man, born free. His mama free, his daddy free. But he angry with me for wanting to be free. Then my soul lit into flame. With or without him, I would not let go of my dream. I'm meant to be free. And I determined there was two things I had a right to. Liberty or death. And if I could not have one, I would have the other. I would die trying. I prayed, Lord, I'm holding steady on to you. And when the time comes for you to take me, I'll be ready to go. Because no man take me live lest you pick the time. See, children, freedom a precious thing. And I grew up like a neglected weed, ignorant of liberty, having no experience of it. Then I was not happy or contented. Every time I saw a white man, I was afraid of being carried away. I had two sisters carried away in the chain gang. And one of them left behind two little children, no mouth to cry out. Brought them back to us. I met hundreds of escaped slaves, but I never met one willing to go back and be a slave. I think slavery the next thing to hell for if a person would send another into bondage, he would, it appears to me, be bad enough to send him to hell if he could. Spirit God, only go when the Spirit say go. No, I'm calling for a song to lift up a heart. Here, take a breath with me. Let now. Don't that feel good? Let's do it again. Now say this after me. All night. All, night. All, day. All day. Angels watching over me. Angels watching over me. All night. All, night. All, day. All day. Angels watching over me. Angels watching over me. They go a little like this. Oh. When I can hear you, I can feel you. It's something we don't tell everybody. You see, when we sing together, pray together, it gives you strength. It takes the aching out your feet. It takes the weary out your back. Here we go again. Oh, let me go first in my turn. Angels watching over me, my Lord. Angels watching over me, my Lord. All night, all day, all night, all day. Angels watching. 
watching over me. Oh, it's getting good. Now let's put a little more in it. Are you ready? Yeah. Stay with me. Oh, nah. you got to stay with me now. Don't you know? <laughs> let's try together. Oh, nah. oh angels watching over me, my Lord. Oh, the best medicine you've got, and it don't cost you nothing. You lift somebody else up with the sound you make. Oh, it's a good thing. Yeah. Day come. When word from the grapevine say that I've been so south. Now, y'all know what the grapevine is, don't you? Well, let me ask you this way. How many of y'all can run fast? Raise your hand. Put it down. How many of y'all can keep a secret? Raise your hand. Put it down. How many of y'all can remember a message what's given to you word for word and not change your word when you pass it on? Raise your hand. Mm. Now, how many of y'all raise your hand every time? Well, you see, it was someone like that. We depended on strong young legs that could run fast, be stealthy, swift, not be seen coming or going, moving from one plantation to the next. It may be a quarter mile, half mile, and on. But they would bring the news. They would bring information that may save somebody's life. That's how we knew someone of us in the field. What was happening for Master to find out up at the big house. And now I was doing my task. I was working, and a little, little boy come to the end of the row where I was working, said, Miss Hatch, you done being so soft. You were leaving Monday with the chain gang. You see, new master was in debt, owing money. He started selling off people. <laughs> Old master say he wouldn't do that. He kept the families together, but new master different kind of man, Dr. Thomas. And so, it was my turn. People coming up missing. No mystery. I thanked him, sent him on his way. He gave me just enough time to make ready. I got my quilt. My ticking bag, a little bit of money I had left from my savings. I got uh, John's hunting knife and uh, the ash cake from the fire. And then I got his shoes. Now, wouldn't that make him angry? And then come dark and John's deep sleep, I made my way to Bucktown, to the Quaker woman's house. Stealing myself away, steal away, steal away, steal away to freedom, steal away, steal away home. I ain't got long to stay. I circled around the house making sure I was quiet, no dogs, no voices. And then I come up and I knock on the door. Who is it? It's Harriet from Doc Thompson's place. Well, the door opened slowly, and a smiling, pearly white face peeped out at me. Looked me over with my quilt and ticking bag, and all and asked me to come in. 
And as I rested myself on the table, she wrote two names on a piece of paper and handed it to me. You see, this was a station on the Underground Railroad, and she told me how to get to the next station. Yeah, I was thinking the Underground Railroad was made of iron and steel. It was made of flesh and blood. People, folks, some black, some white, some even red. But they was all determined to help others find their way safely. I never could repay her. She set my feet solid on that road. I gave her the only beautiful thing I had. I gave her my quilt. And then following her directions, I made my way. And I walked, and I walked, and I walked, until I walked into the free state of Pennsylvania. There was such a glory over everything. Tears just run down my face. The sun come like gold through the trees and over the fields. This was heaven. My Lord, what a morning. My Lord, what a morning. My Lord, what a morning. When the stars begin to fall. <laughs> I looked at my hands to see if I was still the same person now that I was free. But as I slept on that cold damn ground that first night, all I could think of was my mom and my daddy, my brothers and sisters still suffering. Suffering in the quarters. And the light was burning in my heart to go back and get them and to get you. Chief Lake Elementary School. I'm coming for you. <laughs> Are you ready? Get on board this train. We got to make a train. Come on, hook on. Come on, hook on, you hook on, you hook on. Put your hands here. All right, because we say an underground railroad, is it under the ground? No. It's not under the ground, but it's secret. Hook on, we don't want to leave nobody behind. Come on. They tell me you will follow. I'm seeing if y'all got good directions. Now you gotta step up, so be careful. Hold on. You there? All right. You still coming? All right. You watch for everybody else too. Did we make it up here yet? You coming?
Thank you, Tiffany. That was beauty. It's wild, it's wonderful, it's home. From the peaceful sights to the adventurous rivers, we want to protect our great state. But most importantly, we want to protect our people. When someone from our community gets injured in an accident, big insurance companies out of state look at you as a number. At Cranston and Edwards, we fight for you, getting you the settlement you deserve. Cranston and Edwards, we protect you.